Ever wondered what happens to your body in space? Well, astronauts from all over the world get launched on rockets and sent to the International Space Station. Now, some stay for a few months and some stay for a year or more. So how does space affect the body? Well, I spoke to a European Space Agency flight surgeon, AKA Space Doctor, and he told me all. So let's get into it. Make sure you stay till the end to find out whether an Olympic athlete makes an ideal candidate for an astronaut to go live up in the ISS. And the answer will surprise you. What happens to your body in space? Microgravity has an impact on every part of the body. We know that every organ has a function, but if it's not needed as much, it's not gonna function in the same way. So for example, the heart, because of microgravity, will actually not have to do as much work, which means that it's not gonna function in the exact same way as on Earth. If, you are, if your heart, muscles, bones are not used like they are, in normal gravity on Earth, they will lose uh, their functions and start to regress. When Stefan says regress, we're talking about bone and muscle loss. So this is when the mass of the bone and the mass of the muscle decreases. Now there's two different phases that your body goes through when you, know, you or an astronaut goes to space. There are two phases in space. First is adaptation, physiological adaptation. The physiological adaptation is adaptation to microgravity, for example, for the heart. The first is when your body adapts to space due to something called fluid shift. So microgravity causes a migration of fluid from the legs to the upper body and the head. This is fluid shift. What does this feel like for an astronaut? Well, almost immediately, nasal congestion and a feeling of fullness in the head is what astronauts experience. This fluid shift causes a decrease in the amount of blood and fluid in the heart and blood vessels, even while astronauts experience swelling in the face and head. What this means is that the heart does not need to pump as much as before. Therefore, it pumps less than before, and this is adaption of the heart in a microgravity environment. Now, the second phase is when the astronaut actually comes back to earth and this phase is called rehabilitation or deconditioning of the body on return to earth gravity once again pulls the blood and fluids down to the abdomen and legs the loss of blood volume combined with atrophy of the blood vessels and heart that can happen in space actually reduces our ability to regulate like our bodies for example to regulate a drop in blood pressure when we stand on earth some astronauts actually experience something called orthostatic intolerance, which is when the astronaut has difficulty when, when they're standing, they experience lightheadedness and dizziness. So they have this long rehabilitation phase of a few weeks, it's four weeks to one month. How about the effect of going to Mars on the body? On Earth, it's okay because you have surgeons, you have exercise specialists. Have biomedical engineers, but when we will go on Mars after less than a year of traveling, you will be alone. I mean, you will be maybe six, eight crew members with not all these people working for you and doing your rehabilitation on Mars. Uh, but when you are on Mars, you have to survive, you have to find uh, where the food is, you have to find where the water supplies uh, have been sent before, um, you have to find everything uh, that have been sent to Mars before to survive. So you have to adapt and the deconditioning phase, you have to adapt again to the Mars gravity. Um, that's the main problem uh, of going on Mars, you will be alone. We now know about the fluid shift and the effect of microgravity on the body, but don't forget about space sickness. During the first days on the ISS, they experience what we call uh, space sickness, which is almost like uh, motion sickness because you have visual and middle ear and inner ear um, impairment uh, between all the, um, the stimuli you can have from the senses. You can be upside down, but you have people upside down, so your eyes have to adapt, but your ear is saying that you are up. It goes away after a few days um, in space. Uh, you have some medication. Now, astronauts are known to get something that people call the puffy face and the chicken legs. What exactly is this? The same fluid shift that puts all the, the fluids of your body uh, that are normally in the lower part of your body uh, going up towards your, your torso and to the head. You can see the puffy face of the, the astronauts during the first days. 
but we call the puffy face and the chicken legs. Why do astronauts experience bone loss? When you're in space, your body experiences a lack of gravity. This is what I've been calling microgravity. And what that basically means is that there isn't as much pressure on your bones as there would be on Earth. Due to this, your body starts to break down your bones faster than it can build it up, which basically means you lose bone mass very quickly, like 10 times faster than someone who has osteoporosis. So when it comes to this kind of stuff, we gotta be very careful. How, at the moment, is ESA and these space doctors preventing too much bone and muscle loss? So we implement countermeasures like sports, like vibration plates. Uh, you have the train meal, the T2, the train meal on space. Uh, you also have the service and the service two which are the cycling the home cycling an astronaut does about two hours of exercise every day and that is a, a good way to try and prevent you know bone and muscle loss but there are still long-term risks and what are these but there is um, a risk of vision loss not complete one but some visual changes uh, during the space flight that can lead to visual changes that are not reversible on Earth. When back on Earth, astronauts experience dizziness and motion sickness for the first few days. Astronauts have lost quite a bit of bone and muscle loss at this point, so they have to work on rehabilitating that. Remember that for like their bones, they've experienced osteoporosis. Then there is their heart, which is a lot weaker now that it has adapted to space. It being affected by gravity means it has to pump in a way that it has no longer been doing for you know months to a year depending on how long they were in space these are all the things that need to be taken into account during the rehabilitation phase now here's a question for you when applying to be an astronaut you'd imagine that an olympic athlete would have a better shot than the average athlete well this is not necessarily true and why is that the answer to this may surprise you and the funny thing is that microgravity could actually be more dangerous on their body than to that of an average athlete in space you need to take into account the bone and muscle loss and the weakness of the heart so an olympic athlete may not be ideal as the effect of microgravity could be dangerous for them as they may lose too much bone or muscle compared to the average athlete worsening the effect of rehabilitation for them compared to the average athlete as they'll lose too much of their performance so you have to find a good balance between a sports person and an olympic athlete esa the european space agency wants his astronaut candidates to be fit but not too fit as their concern is that the agency cannot ethically have an astronaut losing a significant amount of bone or muscle loss that will affect them functioning back on earth the worry ethically and medically is that the olympic athlete when they come back to earth will lose too much of their performance ability so we've been talking about bone and muscle loss and I've told you that it's quite significant. But exactly how significant? So I'm going to give you a number. In space, you lose 15 to 30 percent of your concentric muscular capacity for, for, for the muscles. Ethically and medically, again, it's not acceptable to, to have muscle damage, non-reversible muscle damage on Olympic athletes. That's why we don't want to. An astronaut will lose about 10 to 15 percent of bone mass on average. Pretty insane, right? Well, check this out. In one month, the astronaut will lose a bone mass equivalent to what elderly person will lose in one year on Earth. Now, microgravity can have severe effects on the body, but let's not forget about radiation. What exactly is the Van Allen belt? The Van Allen radiation belt is a zone of energetic charged particles, most of which originate from the solar wind. The particles are captured by and held around a planet by that planet's magnetic field. Now, it surrounds Earth, containing a nearly impenetrable barrier that prevents the fastest, most energetic electrons from reaching Earth. The thing is, in space, there's actually 250 times more radiation than there is on Earth, and this can cause genetic reproductive disorders and cancer. During the Artemis 1 mission they actually put sensors in the Orion capsule to measure how much radiation is around the moon and we still have yet to find out but it's definitely an interesting experiment. So space has a significant impact on the body but can meds help? There is there is no medication to adapt. There is some symptomatic uh, drugs medication that they can have for space sickness or this kind of thing. What about vitamins? Are there any vitamins they have to take? All of them. It's it's not it's not a question of what type of vitamins, it's a question of nutrition. So we have to be strict on nutrition, on not too much carbs. We need fats. Fat is important but not too much as we as we know. We need good absorption in space. We have absorption problems also with stomach issues, the gastrointestinal tract. 
is not the same in space than uh, on Earth. Balance is key, and just like they say on Earth, it's good to have a balanced diet. It's just a little bit more stricter on the ISS and for astronauts. But the thing is, astronauts can be vegetarian and can have their own dietary requirements. And the space agency, especially ESA, can be really good at adapting to this. So here's a bonus question. When will we see Europeans going to the moon and being part of the Artemis program? Stefan has confirmed that ESA, the European Space Agency, has two or three seats in upcoming Artemis missions. So two or three astronauts, European astronauts, will be part of the Artemis missions, going to the moon, settling on the moon. The thing is, this isn't going to be an Artemis 2, Artemis 3. It's going to be in the future Artemis mission. So something to think about when you hear about the next astronaut call by the European Space Agency. The body goes through a lot in space, from fluid shift to space sickness, you name it. The thing is, you have a team behind you. You have psychologists, you have doctors, flight surgeons, you have nutritionists, you have people there supporting you during both phases, the adaptation phase and the rehabilitation phase. And you've got to give credit to them. And I want to also give credit to Stefan Alamo, the flight surgeon from the European Space Agency, who I interviewed in this video and in the video before where I spoke about astronaut selection. A link to that video is in my description box below. So yeah, thank you for passing on your wisdom and giving me knowledge on all things space medicine. Now, knowing what you know, if you had the opportunity, would you go live in the International Space Station and brave the low gravity and the high radiation? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, stay safe, make sure to like, comment and subscribe, and hopefully one day I will see you in space.